Well, welcome to a very special edition of Back Chat today when we haven't got our three wise men in the Ark at Headingley. We've got one wise man in the Hilton Hotel in Liverpool. It's Marwan Kukash, Dr. Marwan Kukash, the owner of the Salford Red Devils. Very good afternoon to you. Good afternoon to you. Welcome along. Um, two and a half years now as the owner of Salford Red Devils. Mm -hmm. Do you regret getting involved in rugby league or has it been an adventure? Oh, I, I don't regret being involved in the sport. The sport, uh, I grew to love it. And, um, you know, but the only regret I have is I've not been able to deliver the success that I promised to our fans. And also I regret meeting certain people in the sport that I relied on their advice. The, the advice they gave me was not, not the best. Mm. What would you do differently then? I would not ask them again. I would definitely uh, brought in from the start a person like Tim Sheen, somebody that who knows the game and uh, the advice he would give you is for your benefit, you know, and not for his benefit. What would you consider to be the biggest mistake? <laughs> the biggest mistake, obviously, in, um, in the people who I have employed. Okay. Whether some, some of the players there or maybe one or two of the managers, etc. So you're in the middle eights at the moment. Uh, I mean, when you, when you arrived, you would not have envisaged a team that you, you were investing in to be in the middle eights at this stage. Where, at the time, when you, when you first got involved, where would you have expected Salford to be two and a half years Well, ago? really, I mean, in year one, we, uh, I was there. Uh, it was too late to do uh, any changes to the team. And if we, we did, you know, it was, wasn't going to make a massive difference. But for year two, i.e. last year and this year, when you look at the squad of players, We've assembled and they are good, you know, in Beba they looked uh, a very, very capable team and a team that should have been in the top eight. And when we look and see that they failed to get anywhere near the top eight, certain questions have to be asked. Uh, people ask the questions of me and I accept that. But, you know, at the end of the day, I'm always somebody who signs checks, deliver on the promises I said, I'll bring certain players to the, to the club. At the end of the day, it's up to the players uh, to perform. You see, no matter what, um, uh, how much money I invest in the club and no matter how good the coaches are, once the players leave the tunnel to go on the field, it's all down to them. And, you know, the questions have to be asked of them. Why, for two years, we have failed to get into the top eight? Why do you think that is? Do you feel that players have come for the money and maybe haven't played with the club at heart? Okay, I can't say all the players are, but certainly some players, uh, you know, they, they came to us because we paid them more money or we offered them more money than other people. And they weren't, uh, you know, recently I've been going to the under 19s, our, our under 90s, and I've been enjoying every minute of watching them play. And you could tell there's a real team spirit there where people are not playing because it's a job for them, it's because they wanted to perform for the club. Mm. Whereas with the first team, you know, look, at the end of the day, they ha I appreciate they want to earn money and they want to earn as much as they can, but they also have to perform. And um, when you look at their performances, I, I didn't get the feeling that they were playing for, for the shirt. And um, as a result, maybe, maybe we should have built the team on a more solid foundation and started from the very bottom, i.e. investing in the youth and bringing two, three players from that under 19 into the first team squad. So you have people in the team who are connected with the club. They don't necessarily need to be Salford players or players that are born in Salford, but as long as they come through your academy, right, they represent the club mm. and they're not there just for the money. That is a medium to long term project, isn't it? Bringing kids through. So in terms of your short term project. But that process had already started. Yes. But in terms of the short term project now of, of recruiting for next year, how do you change your recruitment policy? Well, at the end of the day, and I've said this before, my job in the club is limited to supporting Tim Sheens on the rugby side and uh, Martin Vickers, the CEO, on the admin side. And when I say support them, don't make decisions for them, support them financially. Because without me, let's face it, there won't be a club, mm. right? And, um, or without my money, there won't be a club. Now, in terms of recruitment, Tim 
meets up on a regular basis with um, his coaching staff and they do identify the, the, you know, players and they have many players on their list. But at the end of the day, they need to be the right players for the club. Possibly maybe not the biggest, you know, the, the most talented or the biggest names, but as long as they will be the right people for the club and they're coming for the right reasons, they are the people we want. So that presupposes that Tim Sheens is going to be here for a while. Are you expecting him to be here next year? And what's the role? Because you've, you've, you've agreed a, a severance now with Yestin Harris. You've got Ian Watson in there in temporary charge, I don't know. Does Ian Watson carry on in that role with Tim above him or how does it change? Well, with Tim, um, I'm absolutely confident that he will be with us for the next two to three years. As in long what, as that? Yeah, in what role? I don't really know, okay? Uh, also, I'm confident that we won't need to bring in or recruit any more into our coaching staff. So it's going to be between Tim, Ian Watson, Martin Gleeson, uh, Gareth Carvel. You know, they're going to be in, in charge mm -hmm. of not only the first team, but also the, 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 the 19s. In what capacities? I'm still awaiting for them to agree. It, it could be where, uh, you know, if Tim stays as the director of rugby, then Ian Watson will automatically become, stop acting and become the head coach. And he's, listen, from what I'm hearing from Tim, Tim is very impressed with the way uh, Ian Watson has been handled, you know, the team and the difficult situations that's arisen recently. And it could be a case where Tim Sheen will, get, will become the head coach. You know, so we have that scenario. Uh, either Tim becomes the director of rugby or Tim becomes the head coach and the, the coaching staff will work with Tim. Mm. If you're in Super League next year, if you're not in Super League next year, is that the end of the project or, or, or would it be to start again? Because there's no guarantee that you're going to be in Super League at this stage. No, there's absolutely no, no guarantee. And listen, the reason why we're uh, not going all the way out for recruitment is because we need to be absolutely sure we are in Super League. Mm. But once we are in Super League, but, but to answer your, your question, am I going to walk out in the club if they go, you know, they're relegated? No, I'm not. You know, I will start, I'll start again and we'll start from the championship if we need to. Mm -hmm. But um, the coaching staff will be there as well. Have you come close to walking out? The famous text, the famous tweet, I've had enough after one big defeat. H have you at any stage in the two and a half years come close to, to walking away? Listen, I'm a human like you, like anybody. And uh, we get frustrated when things are not working for us, you know, uh, working out for us. And sometimes you sit back and say, you know, you know, have I had enough? And occasionally, you know, when things are not going, not just uh, wrong on the field, but elsewhere as well. And that particular day you're referring to, I probably meant it. I have had enough that evening. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, so that's the closest I came to walking out in the club. But once I sat, went back home and, you know, relaxed with the family, etc., you know, I, I knew uh, I had a commitment to fulfill for the fans. And no, I didn't. I could have taken the easy option, and the cheaper option, by the way, much cheaper option. I hope my wife is not going to be watching this. But we have invested large amount of money uh, just to walk out, and uh, uh, and I wouldn't be doing that. How much? If it's not an impertinent question, how how much of your personal wealth have, have you put into Salford? My wife will be watching this program. Okay. So I'm not going to tell you how many millions. A lot more than you expected, but millions. It is millions, is it? My wife will be watching. <laughs> is it more than you expected? A lot more. Yeah. And this is the investment I have made in the club is the biggest investment that's been made into any rugby league club in the last two years, whether it's Super League or NRL. What does Marwan Kukash get out of this? What, what, what is the return for you? You invest money in a business, you want to get money back. You're not going to get money back. Listen, I love, the I love rugby league. I'm determined to succeed. I mean, I guess the biggest love in my life is my wife and my children. Rugby league, second to them. Could I do without it? I doubt it. Uh, but I do want to succeed. 
and there's not many things that I got involved in in life that I haven't succeeded. This is a, a typical project we're sitting in today. This has been like seven, eight years, faced many challenges, right? A lot of investors would have walked away from such challenges, by, stuck by the, the project. And uh, now I have uh, possibly one of the best hotels in Liverpool, if not in the Northwest. Mm. Uh, at the end of the day, the reason I'm uh, gonna stay around is because I believe I could still deliver success for the club. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, I'm, uh, I'm doing this on behalf of the fans. And if the fans think I'm not the right person to be around, then yeah, I, w I will walk out. Because yeah. um, I'm not just doing it for myself. I'm doing it for the fans, for the, for the Salford public. But if they think there's better person, or there's better way is of uh, rebuilding the club than I am, I'm more than willing to leave it to them to do. You talk about the money you've invested, um, and you know, when you came in, there was a big frisson around rugby league. Here's a man who's got a lot of money to invest, who can really turn this club around. There's been a lot of negative publicity come out of Salford. Stories about players not being paid, about bills not being paid. What would you say to that? I mean, how, Mate, how do you answer uh, that question? Uh, talk is cheap, right? Anybody could, you could turn around and say, uh, I went to Marwan's hotel and he hasn't fed me, etc. When I know that I've, I'm going to be uh, giving you a very good meal later on. It's up to be able to say what they want, but they have to, at the end of the day, be accountable for it. And I'm not going to be talking about mentioning names of players, etc. But there's been two well publicized stories, right, that we haven't paid those players. Let me assure you 100% that I don't owe them a penny. Mm. The court hearing, there's already been one hearing. There's another one coming up shortly, which I'm absolutely confident, you know, our, the name of my club will be totally cleared. Now, there has been one or two cases when the players weren't paid on time. But do you know why? Because we paid them early. Right. So there's, could, there's never been a late payment? There's never been a late payment of wages to players. Never. The only times they haven't been bed on time is when they've been bed early. And it hurts me. It hurts me to read stories um, that Marwan hasn't paid us or, you know, wages are late, etc. Because in business, in everything I do, you rely on your reputation, mm. right? People in the past where I could pick the phone up and speak to any player in the world that I wanted to because of the positive reputation I had in racing and in business. Now, certain individuals are determined to ruin that, right? And if I come out publicly and fight them back, I don't want people to criticize me by saying to me, you should keep these th things behind closed doors. At the end of the day, it's them individuals brought this to the public. And it's my job to fight back or to protect the reputation of our club. The, the, the stories don't surface though from clubs like Wigan, Leeds, Hull, um, St. Helens. Why do you think they're surfacing at St. Helens then, if, if, it's, if they are not true? I don't know why, but uh, maybe people grew uh, to want a story coming out of Salford every week. And when uh, I got them used to that in the first year or two, and now they're making up their own stories. But look, there are some elements out there that would love to see the demise of Salford or the demise of Marwan Kukash, uh, you know, in terms of being out of the game. And, mate, all what you have to do, right, just to examine, you know, the recent public stories about players wanting, haven't been bad or wanting to leave, and that, that we have been breaches of contracts. I'll tell you this, it's the works of small time agents and small time lawyers. Just quickly on Rangi Chase, um, at the moment there's a, a story surface this week about him being suspended. Is there anything you can tell us about that at this stage? No, no not, I'm not going to discuss the reasons behind it. It's uh, like everybody, you know, well not like everybody because you only got to hear about it today. I got to know about it a couple of days ago when uh, the rugby side told me of the, their decisions. They, did not, they didn't need to consult me, but out of courtesy, before it became public, they, they told me uh, of their decision, 
and the reasons behind it. Listen, I love Rangi Chase and I love to see him play. And I think a lot of our fans feel exactly the same way and will be disappointed that he's not in the team. But I've been made aware of the reasons behind it. And I respect and accept the decision that's been made. Well, welcome back to this special edition of Back Chat. Marwan Kukash, the, uh, the Salford owner, is, um, is with us today. Marwan, um, you, you've had some stinging criticism from within the game. Um, perhaps the most outspoken recently was the Leeds coach, Brian McDermott. You, uh -huh. Your Salford side went to Leeds, you were beaten very heavily, and he laid that defeat very squarely at your feet and questioned <laughs> your leadership capabilities. Did that criticism sting you? It hurts me. It hurts me for many reasons. First of all, I, I, I'm, I have full confidence in my leadership uh, ability. There's so many different styles of leadership. And, um, you know, I, the way I lead have led me to where I am now, being a very successful man in business and, and in sport. As for Brian McDermott, um, uh, I think our team went there at the back of uh, two fantastic wins against Halkiar and Catalan. And uh, we had an off day. And I actually wasn't even in, um, at the match. I was in Dubai. And um, following the game on Twitter, and obviously it was a very, very heavy defeat, and I was very, very disappointed. But uh, then um, what made uh, the evening even worse for me uh, is what I read uh, or heard what Brian said. And really that surprised me in many ways because I've always considered uh, Brian to be sort of a friend in rugby league. You know, um, before and after each ga of our games when we play each other, he'd come to me and he would compliment me on what I'm trying to do uh, and say, you know, well done, stick by it, etc. So to hear his comments were absolutely shocking. Hmm. Um, if he, Was there I mean, any element of that, though, that made you think, Maybe I should listen to what he said, or, or, or did you dismiss it completely? No, I'll dismiss it totally. There's nothing Brian can say that teach, you know, to, or try to teach me that would improve my leadership skills. Mm. Quite to the contrary, you know, I'm a, there is one or two things that uh, you know, if he does attend my leadership classes, and what Brian needs to understand when he talks about leadership, he's talking to somebody who delivers leadership training to the leaders of the industry. So I don't need somebody like Brian to teach me how to, train, to, to lead. Would you say you're a difficult man to work for, though? No, I'm not. A demanding man to work for? Listen, you know, whether I'm working here in the hotel, whether I'm in racing and in rugby, my training business, my numerous other business, I demand success. I don't want to be taken part in racing just to, to have a runner in a race or to take part in rugby just to have, you know, just to be, to say I'm a, the owner of a rugby club. I need to be successful. And I won't stop, I won't let anything get in the way. But what's it, I mean, again, going back to Brian McDermott, if Brian, I believe he had an agenda there. And he knows that I know. What's the agenda? Ask him. Well, I'm, as, I'm asking you. No, no, he I'm has asking. an, I'm telling you, yeah. right, right now, Brian, for him to come out, and say what he said, he had an agenda. And Brian, if you're watching, mate, I know what your agenda is. Could right? you be, could you As I've been truthful here in front of the cameras, I'm saying you have an agenda. Come out and tell them you, what your agenda is. If not, I'll tell everybody what's your agenda, maybe in a few months' time when, once this dies out. Because, mate, if you, and I'm, again, I'm going to look at the cameras and tell, Brian, if you needed to tell me something, if you were really concerned about uh, my club or my team, we could have had a chat after the game like we've always done. Why come out publicly, right, in front of TV and in front of the media and criticize Marwan Kukash, who wasn't even at the game? There's a lot of criticism of business, in sport generally, not just rugby league, but sport generally. Businessmen who've been successful out with the sport, who then come into the sport and think they can apply those same principles to the sport, and it doesn't often work. 
there are people within the game, Gary Hedrington at Leeds, for example, Ian Lenigan at Wigan. Um, did you seek them out when you came in to seek their advice as to how to run a rugby league club? Of the two names you mentioned, yeah. Would I go for the other name? I'd never ask him for advice because it's just literally like asking a prostitute for a hug. It will cost you and it won't be truthful. Which name are we talking about there now? Which, which, one, have you say, which one are you saying? Are you offering that analogy to? You're not going to tell us. I'm sure you know. Okay. But, you know, when we've been talking about uh, strategy or people have an agenda, do you feel then that within the game, within the hierarchy of the game, there is an agenda that's working against you? I'd love to think no, okay? And why do you think that is? I, I, I'd love to, to think that for a person that the sport will always welcome people who are willing to invest, whether it's Marwan or somebody else, we, we, need, we need to attract them people who are willing to put money in and uh, bring some kind of publicity to rugby league because that's all what I've done. I've not done anything else to endanger the sport. All what I've done from the word go since I came into the sport is I've done nothing but to invest in the sport, to work for the sport, to publicize the sport, and I'm, I'm not sure why certain elements maybe within the RFL does not want Marwan Kukash to be involved. So within the governing body, because famously it was a meeting with Nigel Wood, the chief executive of the RFL, yeah. that brought you into the sport. Yeah. But you seem to have fallen out with him quite considerably. No, Nigel since. Wood, right, let me. Nigel Wood is an easy target, you know, to have a bit of laugh with on Twitter. Okay? Yeah. But no, I, I, Nigel Wood is not. Nigel, I respect Nigel. Nigel gets an awful lot of criticisms. I respect Blake Sully for the excellent work he's doing in the Super League. But there are one or two people there. Uh, I've, uh, I don't exactly have the same kind of respect for as I do for Nigel and, uh, and Blake. Do you feel you get the support then from the RFL that you, you feel you should have? And what kind of support would that be? Well, let's, let's face it. The people who brought me into the sport are the RFL because they wanted an honor for Salford and they wanted an honor to maybe promote the sport. Have I had any help from them? No, I, did, I never had any help. Um, when I came in, I was promised a bigger cap in order to rebuild the side because really, you know, in January 2013 when I took over the club, we hardly had any players, mm. right? And I had to start from scratch. And to, to build a, a competitive side with 1.8 million pounds was ne never going to work. And I know early uh, in the discussions, they were going to give uh, Solford an exemption uh, to, for a cab of 2.25 million pounds. But again, they've gone back on it. Who's that, the club or the, R the clubs or the RFL? have gone back on that? Was it the clubs? Well, no, no, uh, I believe it's the RFL. The RFL? Yeah, yeah. They went back on that. Okay. Do you pick up the phone to anybody else at any other club? You you've obviously um, do not have a great deal of respect for, for one or two owners, but are there owners who you do pick up the phone to on a regular basis? Yeah, talk always. To I, who, I who, talk who, to Simon Moran on a regular basis, Neil Hudgel, that I believe the Hall FC fans are calling him Nil Hajjal now. Sorry, Neil, I couldn't help that. Um, I speak uh, to Ian Lenigan on a regular basis. Uh, yeah, but there are one or two uh, owners uh, who I don't really wish to socialize with or communicate with, and they're not going to be on my Christmas card list. I'm not going to send them any Christmas cards, and I'm not going to expect one from them either. Okay. Um one of the big ideas that you brought to the game, or certainly your voice was the strongest behind, was the marquee player. I think it took five votes for that to go through, but it eventually has gone through, and now we have the marquee player. What difference is that going to make to the game? What difference? Hmm. It's going to allow the clubs to bring in big names into the sport. Names uh, that not only 
going to bring in a playing ability to the sport, you know, but also going to create uh, a huge buzz. Now, just look at this scenario, right? Sam Berge is playing in the World Cup. Have a, I'm absolutely sure he's going to be a star name. Right? Just imagine if in 12 months' time, Sam Burgess to announce that he's going back to Super League because Super League made it possible for him to go, you know, with the marquee signing. It's going to be a huge publicity for Rugby League, not just for Salford or any club he goes to. It would be huge. Sam Burgess not only would be known to Rugby League players, people or audience, but the whole of audience of Rugby Union, and that would be a huge victory for uh, Rugby League. So is Sam Burgess a player that's in Salford sites? Well, again, it's, uh, it all comes down to the boss, and here the boss, I'm talking about Tim Sheens, and, you know, the, the marquee player, uh, was, we were never going to sign him this year because, um, you know, the player or players we wanted uh, are not available. Uh, in 2017, we are very confident that we, in Salford, we will have a marquee signing. And top of that list will be Sam Burgess. So we can't expect any big names next year from Salford, but in 2017, we could expect an absolute stellar name and, and Sam Burgess could well, be a target for you. You see, when I say to you uh, things like uh, Tim Sheens has been a calming influence on me and everybody in the club, there are some big names available for next year, 2016. But are they the right players for the club? Mm -hmm. And when you sit and talk to the wise man, Tim, he tells you why they're not the right people for the club. Generally, well, we're, 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 our mouths are watering at the prospect of, of what you're hinting at there. But generally speaking, how much of a difference can the marquee player make to rugby league generally? Because we see the NRL whose salary cap is going up and up. We know that Rugby Union are spending a lot more than Rugby League can afford. So apart from the one or two clubs, Salford being perhaps an exception, are you, going to, are you expecting many marquee signings from clubs? Well, I think the likes, again, I don't want to interfere with other people's businesses, but the likes of uh, Wigan, uh, I presume they'll use that allowance to pay for the likes of Sam Tompkins. Uh, Leeds, no doubt, will use their allowance to pay for, uh, you know, uh, Watkins or whoever they choose to put in there. St. Helens will probably do the same with one of their players. Mm. Realistically, I think only us and, we, and uh, Warrington are going to have marquee players, um, you know, 2017, etc. But Sam Tompkins is a marquee signing. And the fact that uh, St. Helens could keep the likes of James Robey or Leeds could keep Watkins, etc., that's, that's what a marquee signing has enabled the clubs to do. And do you feel, I mean, I think the famous phrase, time to put your money where your mouth is, I think that came from the Leeds chief executive, Gary Hetherington. Yeah. Do you feel that if you can make a big signing, if you can bring a Sam Burgess in in 2017, that justifies what you're doing? And if you fail to do that, then D does again that reflect on what you what you're about? A marquee signing for us to justify all this work that's been done, and like you said, five votes, right? Yeah, one or two clubs need to put their money where their mouth is, me included, and be able to bring somebody of the status of a Sam Burgess. Is it a matter of pride for you to be able to do that? It's not a matter of pride. It's a matter of. Um, wanting uh, to deliver um, and in the belief I have and I, I, I still believe and will always believe a marquee player will take the sport from there to there. Yeah, it's a tough, it's a tough road though isn't it because Rugby League is a long way behind the NRL, the Super League is a long way behind the NRL. It's a, a long, long way, way behind, behind the NRL and it's a long way behind Union yep. and we all need to work in the same direction Pull together, and I don't want Super League or Rugby League to have two camps. The Gary Hetherington camp and maybe the Marwan Kukash camp where we're pulling in different directions. Mm. 
is there a danger of Lee being blown out of the water this next few months because of the Rugby Union World Cup? Do you worry a, 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 a danger of Rugby League being blown out of water, the Rugby Union World Cup? We Do have you to worry be about careful. what's on the horizon? We have to be careful, right? Because one of the... Uh, during, on the same day as the grand final that's going to be played in Manchester, mm. we see Union have scheduled uh, one of their games, World Cup games, earlier in the day in Manchester. That's not coincidence. They're mm. going all out to fight rugby league. And, um, uh, but rugby, they know how to market their sport. A couple of months ago, uh, I was on a holiday, I got on a flight from Dubai to come here. And it was, the World Cup was branded on most of the Emirates flights. Mm. So they do a far better job in marketing their sport and their competition than we will ever do. Well, welcome back to the third and final part of this back chat special with uh, Marwan Kukash, the, the Salford Red Devils owner. Marwan, you find yourself in a bit of jeopardy at the moment, or the club finds itself in a bit of jeopardy at the moment with the, the middle eights, as we said earlier, no guarantee of you being in Super League next year. How's the system working for you? The middle eights? Yeah, the middle eights, the eights, the, the, the new system we've got this year. Well, the middle eights, uh, I think it's been unfair. Uh, it's been uh, unfair to the championship clubs. Uh, I'm saying this even at the expense of my club. Uh, now, when you, uh, when a salary cap is introduced, it's introduced so that all teams could play at a level playing field. How could you have four championship clubs playing with a salary cap that's almost only half of what Super League clubs uh, mm -hmm. are playing? So straight away, uh, you know, you're not rewarding a success um, of the or the hard work that's been done all season by the teams like Bradford and Lee, you know they had fantastic season, and what we are asking them now to do is to compete against the likes of my club, but uh, we have an advantage over them because we have a salary cap of 1.8, they have a salary cap of what about a million, so how could you do that? Well, they are competing. I mean, Bradford beat. They are competing. Famously. It's Bradford, yeah, uh, but are you going to have that kind of result? week in and week out. You know, it could be that um, uh, it was a very bad day for us, which I think it was, and a very good day for Bradford. But that's not, you can't. Lee and Bradford finished first and second, right? And you can't uh, reward them by asking them to just compete with Super League clubs for a possibility of a promotion, even if they beat Say, for example, Bradford finishes fourth. They still have to go and play in this million pound mm. uh, game. And I, I, I wish the RFL would stop calling it the million pound game because it's not a million pound game, right? It's a gimmick. Uh, it's not a gimmick. When I say a gimmick, the name is being given uh, to it as a gimmick. You know, it's not a million pound, mm. full stop. But again, the team that uh, finishes, uh, if Bradford finishes fourth, they still have to play. Uh, another game to to get a chance of being promoted. So the bottom eight, there's no way it's a fair system. What the RFL should do is to allow championship clubs in the Middle East to recruit players, even if they have to do it on loan, right, for a short period, so they are given a fair chance of competing as, against Super League clubs. We strengthened for the Middle East, Wakefield strengthened for the Middle East, Lee and Bradford couldn't mm. because they didn't have room in their cap. Mm. One of the, the issues that's been raised about the, the eights, the top eights, the middle eights, has been the crowds that have not been as good as people expected. And your crowds generally uh, have not been great. You had the famous free day where you let everybody in, but, but you didn't seem to get many more than you would normally get. How do you tackle that? How do you get people into right. Salford? Let me, let, let me come back to Salford in a minute because th this is really about, um, you asked about the structure, etc. Yeah. Now, if we, we talked about the middle eights, let, let's talk about the top eights. I agree with the RFL, you know, it, it, it's been a great uh, new structure for the first 23 rounds, where every game mattered, 
Mm. Beyond that, we are only three weeks into the Super uh, Top 8s, and there are uh, teams like uh, Salford, it's not Salford, sorry, uh, Warrington, Catalan and Hull have nothing to play for, mm -hmm. right? Now, when you're talking about crowds, to just uh, look at the crowds between, uh, you know, I would be interested to see what the crowd between when Warrington play Hull. They've got nothing to play for. Of course, the crowd's going to be down. A better way of doing this would be to say, right, we want to reward success for the first 23 rounds, but we want to keep every game live, alive for, you know, in the middle eight. And to do this, easy. You say, right, the top three teams qualify for, you know, uh, the semifinals. The fourth team is not the team that finishes fourth after it. It's the team that performs best in the middle eights. So a new competition, so to speak. Within well, it's not. A, it's a competition within a competition. Yeah. So if we look where we are now, we're looking at, obviously, Leeds is going to be in the semi. Wigan will be in the semi, and Huddersfield. I had to say, example, yeah. whoever is third. Now St Helens is fourth. They lost the three games, hmm. right? Why they should be rewarded with uh, a tea, you know a place in the semi, whereas you get a, a club like Catalan or Hull have already won games. So what we say, right? For the other five clubs, guys, it's have what you do in the top eight. That would count. Hmm. Would count at the end of the season. That's interesting. Um, but going back to Salford, I mean, how worried are you? And, and what do you do I'm, I'm, to, I'm, to reverse listen, that? Listen, I'm really very, very disappointed with our crowd. Uh, yes, I have. Uh, I've done everything that I could do. You know, it's um, in terms of making it possible for people to come in. Is it the stadium? Is it the stadium? The stadium is. Listen, the stadium is possibly one of the best in Super League. Yeah. I think once certain developments take place outside the stadium, and we start, we're starting to see some of those there, right? And uh, the new road linking the stadium to the traffic center. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. The new st the stadium will be one of the most accessible. Yep. And it will become almost like a destination to go there. Okay, so that, that we should help us a great deal. But what I also need to do is I need to take Rugby League or promote Rugby League into Manchester, mm. right? And there might be the possibility of us playing one or two Rugby League games in, in Manchester. At Old Trafford, Main Road? Then, well, 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 whatever, we haven't decided. Yeah. Okay, but we do need to take the game into, uh, into Manchester and entice them to come back to the stadium. Do you consider a rebrand then? Salford Red Devils, do they become Manchester Red Devils? No, I'll never call it Manchester Red Devils. Right, that's uh, insulting, uh, Salford. Okay, but Salford, the Red Devils will always be known as a Salford uh, club. Whether Salford name is there or not, you know the club will always be uh, associated with Salford. By that, you know, if you if <coughs> in the future when people talk about Red Devils, I want them to automatically assume it's Salford. Mm. But if you start adding the word Manchester Red Devils, you've cut all your connections with uh, Salford. So that 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 connection, that 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 umbilical cord, back to where the club is born, is very important to you. Of course, it's. Uh, it's tradition, and I won't take that away from the club. So how do you break down that barrier? How do you make people in Manchester feel like this is something that they want to support as well? Maybe call it the Red Devils to them, for them, and, uh, uh, you know, take a, a lot of people, uh, uh, when you have a sporting event in Manchester, whether it's netball or basketball, etc. when we're talking about in Manchester, people come and watch. Mm. So I'm, I'm going to take one or two games of Rugby League to Manchester right, and play there and uh, promote the game there that way. Is this next season? 
Would you do that next season? L L Wigan are famously taking a match down to Millwall. Yeah, and, and I, at the you know, it's a fantastic so. idea. And, uh, yeah, I will do it next year. Yeah. And the venue? I mean, it's the venue, they're pretty large venues, aren't they? Old Trafford. There are City, some large uh, venues where they use the likes of Old Trafford, etc. As long as you take the game into Manchester, we're looking at different venues, at different options. Yeah. Um, any other ways of increasing that crowd? What other ways have you, have you failed to succeed in as a club? Would you say we need to have stability yeah we need to have players who are performing for the club you need success with what, stability comes success what would be success would you say do you have to win a trophy i am uh we've got a three-year strategy from now from 2016 in 2016, I wanted to be, to have stability in the club and to have a team that could easily compete in the top eight and even win that competition. 2017 will be the time I expect the club to grow and become a top eight. 2018 is the t year in which I want the club or the team to be knocking at the door of a semi-final whether it's a Super League or a Challenge Cup final. So the dream would be, just going back to the marquee player, would be to have a really big name in there, you know, hinted at the possibility of Sam well, 2000, 2018. We have, we have an awful lot of work to do to, to bring stability into the club, right? The, no doubt there will be some changes to names of players, you know, players in, players out, etc. I want to have that stability. I want to to have a solid foundation next year that we could build on for year 2017 and 2018. Mm -hmm. Without the solid foundation, we're going to end up with the same kind of results we've had in 14 and 15. Is there an end date for you? Is there a date where you've looked into the future and said, you know, if I've not achieved it by this stage, I'm going. Or even if I have achieved something by this stage, I'm going. I'm sure the fans will tell me of that day right. or date. So you would listen, if the fans came in number and said, Marwan, enough. Enough, and we've had enough of you, Mr. Kukash. I'll say, right, you know, I, I'm doing this for you. And if you think you've had enough, uh, I'll, uh, I'm more than happy to walk. What would be the consequences for the club, would you say? If, for example, you walk tomorrow? Uh, the consequences is I have to ensure that there's financial stability, right? Next year, if the... If the, the fans want me out, uh, there is, the club could survive without me because of the changes we're making. Uh, the club last year was paying a huge amount of money for people who weren't pl even playing for the club and on settlements and, and so on. Uh, that money will be saved for next year. And, um, um, you know, we'll, I even if we have to move one or two players, uh, the club will be financially stable. So if Marwan Kukash wasn't there in the club for, Next year, people will look back and say, well, we're still in Super League. We are in a far, far better position than we were three years earlier because three years earlier, we couldn't take our place in, in the competition because we nearly went into administration because of the debt, etc. Next year, the club uh, financially is stable and doesn't need uh, to rely on people like Marwan Kukosh or others, mm. right? And all what it needs is for the fans to start going and watching the game and pay for it. But there have been stories again this year about, about potential winding up orders, and, and you've, you've talked about that publicly no, as well. Is, listen, that a, is there an end to that now? Is that, is that, it's gone. That's gone. And that will never happen again? Mate, it's peanuts compared to what has been invested in the club, the amounts we're talking to. About. And you didn't want to say before, in case your wife was watching, how much you've already put into the club. How much I'm not going to tell I, you because not only she's no. watching or she'll be watching, yes. she's close by as she's well She's listening now. as well now. But do you anticipate putting a lot more into the club or from what you've said, do you feel it's more self-sustaining now? You know, when we talked about stability, I really believe, and I have um, a business plan and a financial plan for this, that next year the club could break even, right? and start to grow as, not just as, as a team playing on the field, but as a brand as well, mm. start to grow in that brand. Uh, and to break even, 
that means getting more people through the gates, presumably. So have you got a kind of an average figure of, of how many you want to see through the gates for an average home game? Next year, we're looking at four, between four and 4.25. Do we see more of you from here on in, or less of you? Because you've, you've had a great profile. Uh, Twitter followers have enjoyed you. Uh, I don't think you've necessarily always enjoyed the replies you get back from Twitter followers. I get a sense that you've just stepped back a little from that recently. Am I, have I not just been missing I've it? been enjoying uh, my family and enjoying the, uh, the racing okay. as well. But recently I've had uh, some big winners in racing. But is there not a conscious decision to step away from the limelight? Or, or, do you enjoy the limelight? I've, I've, do I enjoy the limelight? Mm. No, I don't. No? So are we going to be seeing less of you? Or more of well, you. it depends if you if you want uh, another interview. I'll, uh, I'm never never gonna say no. You know, it depends whether uh, people want to see me or not. Yeah, but the Tim but Sheen's influence has that has that played a part? The in Tim that? Sheen influence, the calming influence he has on me and everybody in the club. Maybe it's one of the reasons why you you don't hear so much of me, and you don't read so much nonsense on Twitter. And when you're in your dotage and you've retired from all of this and, and you're enjoying luxury on some island somewhere or another, how would you like to look back on your stewardship of the Salford Red Devils? Hard. It's been very, very tough. I don't think many people would stuck around. And um, I would like to turn around, you know, to be remembered for being the owner that took the club to Wembley final in such a very, very long time. Marwan, thanks for joining it's us today. It's not much to ask for, but that's my wish. Marwan, thanks for joining us today. Cheers, mate.